Uh, welcome to uh, Not Club today. We're hearing from Shanice Walker. She's going to be telling us uh, about her experience, the research that she did at an RU, which is. Um, are you going to go into this? Yes. All right. You know what? I will let you do this then. Uh, you just give me a look when you want me. And do I just press this button here? Yeah. All right. All right. So good afternoon, good evening. My name is Shanice Walker, and this past summer I was granted an opportunity to do math research at Iowa State University which at first I was a little nervous about, but I thought it was great because I needed the exposure to see how do I use my math outside of just the classroom and just learning books and things like that. So after a while doing that research, I actually had the opportunity to write a mini grant, which gives me opportunities to attend other conferences such as the Joint Mathematics Meetings as well as SOCNAS, which are really two, two really big conferences that I really want to go to. I'm going to SOCNAS next week, I'll be in California. So. so just one little question. You mentioned the people with joint work. Is Michael Young like sort of a big burly football player-ish kind of guy? No, he actually isn't. Have you met him? There is a Michael Young who went to the same graduate institution. I Which did. one? Carnegie Mellon? Yes. Yes, that is him. Okay. <laughs> yes, he was the post doctor. Like okay, a small one. <laughs> it really is. Anyway. Um, so I wrote the mini grant and I'll be able to, do, to go to different conferences as well as present, as well as network with other individuals. And so my project that we focused on this past summer was the propagation time of the graph. And I worked with Dr. Leslie Hogan, which was my faculty mentor. Me, Hunt, and Sarah Meyer, were, they were both undergraduate students inside the RU as well. Nicola Kingsley was the graduate mentor, and my BM was the postdoc, as we already discussed. So my project will be on the propagation time of the graph. So first I'll introduce some background information, and then I'll tell you what, exactly what is the propagation time of the graph. And then I will present results on graphs with extreme propagation time, as well as the comparison of diameter with the propagation time of the graph. And so we'll first start out very simple with the, um, the definition of a graph. So a graph consists of a set of vertices, V here, so all of these are vertices, and edges, as, which are the line segments that are drawn between the two vertices. But the graphs that we consider for our work were simple undirected graphs, meaning that there were no roots within the vertices here, as well as there was no orientation of the edges, so we don't have any arrows directly in the graphs. So from that, I'll introduce the definition of a color change rule because it's very important in our study of the propagation time of the graph as well as the zero forcing number, which propagation time stems from. So the color change rule states that if we have a black vertex B, like a black vertex here and an A here, and A only has one white neighbor, we can force that one white neighboring vertex to be black. So notice here, as I've shown already, we have A. A only has one white neighbor, so A can force B to be black. But if we looking at this, if we look at the black vertex here, D, D has two white neighbors, so by the color change rule, it cannot perform the force and it can't color anything black. And so the final color that we get from coloring the entire graph black is called is the derived color set into in, in which we derive, we color every vertex black until no more color changes are possible. So we have this idea of a zero forcing set. So what is a zero forcing set? A zero forcing set is a set of initial black vertices that are used to color an entire graph of black. So, and then we talk about the zero forcing number of the graph. The zero forcing number of the graph is the number of vertices that are, that are in the zero forcing set. So you're not putting any bound on how many steps are needed to turn them all black? Yeah. That's what propagation time actually is. Oh. <laughs> yes. All right. So, yep, but, but I get the idea. So there's, there's individual steps of forcing and they chain on each other. Yes. Okay. And that's what the whole idea of propagation time is in that we'll talk about. Okay. And so then we have a minimum zero forcing set. And the minimum zero forcing set is a zero forcing set such that the cardinality of the zero forcing set is actually equal to the zero forcing number. So in this graph, we have the zero forcing number graph of this graph is 2, but the zero forcing set of this graph is A and D. And so looking by using our definition of the color change rule, we see that A can perform a force, so A will force B to be black. And again, D is not able to perform a force because it has two white neighbors. So then B forces C to be black. And so now that we see that since now that both D and C are black, we have that C forces H to be black and D can force E to be black. And we continue this process until all the verses are forced black. So respectively, both E and H forces F and G to be black. So now that we've established the whole idea of zero forcing numbers, color change rule, and zero forcing sets, we'll talk about the propagation time of the graph. So we have a graph G, and it has a minimum zero forcing set B. 
Then at time zero, the only vertices, the only the initial vertices that are in the zero portion set are colored black. And at time one, using the color change rule, all of the vertices that can be forced are forced independently. And we continue this process until all of the vertices have been forced. And the number of times that it takes to force this entire graph black is called the propagation time of the graph. So if we have a graph W and we force it at time one, we say W is forced at time one. That's like the correct, the correct notation that we use for this. So the next example that actually shows you is the propagation time of the graph. So as you see here, using our, as we showed in our previous graph, we have the zero force instead of this graph is equal to zero, I mean it's equal to two. Or the zero force instead of this graph is AD, the zero force the number of this graph is two. And at time zero, the only the initial set of black vertices are used, which, which is only the set of the zero force instead of in the um, graph, is in that set. But at time one, we have A forces B to be black, and again, using the color change rule, we know that D cannot perform a force because it has two white neighbors. So at time two, B forces C to be black, and only now can we see that both D and E will be able to, will be able to perform a force. So at time three, according to the definition of propagation time, both D and C can perform a force because this, the propagation time says that all, it forces all the vertices that can be forced using the color change rule. So both B and C forces C and H um, e and H be black respectively. And then at time four, both E and H perform a perform force and they force F and G to be black. And so from this defin from the definition, the basic definition of propagation time, we wanted to establish properties on graphic minimum propagation times and maximum propagation times. So I raised questions about what is that? So the minimum propagation time of the graph is the minimum of all propagation times of all minimum zero force and sets of the graph. And we have that the maximum propagation time of the graph is the maximum of all you know, is the maximum of all propagation times of all minimum zero force and six. So we also have a propagation time interval, which is just the interval in which the minimum propagation time of the graph and the maximum propagation time of the graph is included. So here in this next example, we have that we have a graph of a generalized star with two, five, and eleven vertices attached to its arms. And so, looking at this graph here, we have all the possible minimum zero force sets of this graph, of this, of this generalized star that's up here. And to the right, we have the minimum propagation times of that graph with respect to zero force set. So, by choosing U1 and W3 as a vertex, as the zero force set of this graph, we have that the minimum propagation time of this graph would actually be 12. But if we choose U3 and W1 as um, a zero force set of this graph, we would have that the propagation time of this graph would be, would be 16. And so, therefore, you have you know that the minimum propagation time of this graph is actually 12. The maximum propagation time of this graph is 16. The propagation interval of this graph is from 12 to 16. But we also want to take note that looking at this graph here, we know that we have 12, we have 12, 13, 15, and 16, but 14 is not included. And this is something that we learned that not every integer that is included within the propagation time of the graph or propagation time interval of the graph has to be included in the actual graph. So that's what this actually shows. And then we create some bounds because we wanted to do further research and which these bounds would be useful when we talk about the extreme propagation times of the graph. So we created a lower bound for the minimum propagation time of the graph. And a lower bound is uh, for the minimum propagation time of the graph is the order of the graph minus the zero force in one divided by zero force in set. The zero force number. And the reason this bound is created is because if at each time every black vertex in the graph can perform a force, this is the best bound that we could have in which this, this will give us the lowest propagation time for that graph. And for the maximum propagation time of the graph, we have this upper bound that, that is the upper bound for the propagation time of the graph is the order of the graph minus the zero force number. And this is created because if at each time, which we'll see when we talk about graphs, the, ne the actual next slide, when we Sorry. So this ground bound is created because if at each time only one vertex can perform a force, this gives us this gives us the largest propagation time we can have for a graph. So now we will talk about graphs with extreme propagation time. And so we characterize graphs with high propagation time and graphs with low propagation time. And so we as we proved the first problem theorem that prop the propagation time of a graph that has that's equal to the order of the graph minus one. So we have that the minimum propagation time of the graph is equal to the order of the graph minus one if the 
deals us, tells us that the maximum propagation of the time of is equal to the order of the graph minus one, and the zero forcing number of that graph is equal to one. And that's based on the bound that we have created for the, that was an upper bound for the maximum propagation time of the graph in the previous two slides. Here. But the only graph that has this property is the graph of a path. So, are you saying more familiar with what a path looks like? Is that what a path looks like? Okay. And so now we'll turn to the results on the minimum propagation time of the graph equal to the order of the graph minus two. And so we know that the minimum propagation time of the graph is equal to the order of the graph minus two if the zero forcing number of the graph is actually two, based on the um, upper bound that we have for the maximum propagation time of the graph. And so in Darren Rose's thesis paper, he proved that the zero forcing number of a graph is equal to two, if and only if it is a graph on two parallel paths. A graph on two parallel paths is a graph is two paths that are parallel to each other in a plane, and they have edges drawn between them as line segments, and they do not cross. But from this result was quite difficult and more com was a more complex result. Then the, um, the propagation time of the graph is equal to the order minus one. So we established some lemmas to help us completely characterize this result. So we have the following lemma that if G is let G be a connected graph. And the minimum propagation time of the graph is equal to the order of the graph minus two, if and only if G is a graph, if, if and only if G is the graph of a path with the disjoint unit of a singleton graph as we have here in this example. And we also have the next number that says that if the graph for the graph of the tree, the minimum propagation time for the graph of the tree is equal to the order of the tree minus two, if and only if the tree is a complete bipartite graph on one degree vertices as we have here. And the last, result, the last lemma or result that we, we established is, is the previous results in contradiction to this one? Could I see what the previous slide? This one? Oh, disconnected graph. Okay, never mind. Yeah, so we, it was actually three different types of graphs that we have for this. Okay, I wanted to make sure the types of graphs of this lemma and the next one didn't overlap. Okay. Yeah, okay. And so now we have, we established what is a zigzag graph. And this, we worked on a long time, because it was a really, really big result, and we actually finished this not too long ago. But a zigzag graph is a graph on two parallel paths in which there's a zigzag path operating between the two paths. And they have this special zigzag label in here that we use to characterize them. They also have, their edges are unique. So the endpoints of these graphs are very unique. And here, the red lines, these are optional lines, so we can include them, and they wouldn't actually change what we're looking for. But so this is this is an example of a special zigzag, zigzag graph. And so in order to get the results we want, we want us to look at all zigzag graphs. So we have this degenerate special zigzag graph. And so these zigzag graphs, these two zigzag graphs actually don't work, and graphs that are isomorphic to them don't work because we want the propagation time of our graph to be the order of the graph minus two. But using the color change rule, we see that at time one, both of these vertices will perform a force. But this will actually give us a smaller propagation time than the order of the graph minus two. And here we have an example. We, we've established an example where it will actually work, where the propagation time of this graph will actually be the order of the graph minus two. But that's not the smallest. We want the smallest propagation time of the graph to be the order of the graph minus two. So if we choose two endpoints, if we choose these two endpoints, this will actually give us the smallest propagation time of this graph. So at, both, at time one, both of the endpoints perform a force, a force in, and this whole entire graph will be forced at a smaller time than by choosing these two. And so we wanted to have the minimum propagation time of those graphs to be the order of the graph minus two. That is why the degenerate special graphs do not work. So after establishing that, we proved the following theorem, that if we let G be a graph, then the minimum propagation time of G is equal to the order of the graph G minus two, if and only if, G is one of the, if you know, if it's a graph of one of the following, uh, uh, the graph of a path with the disjoint singleton, union with the disjoint singleton, the, a complete bipartite graph on one and three vertices, and a special zigzag graph that is not degenerate, as in you see in the previous example of the degenerate graphs. And so now that we've established graphs that have high propagation time, we return to graphs that have low propagation time. So we have this very, very subtle observation that. A graph has the propagation time equal to zero if its maximum propagation time is equal to zero and its zero forcing number is actually the order of the graph. So that means, this means that all of the vertices in the graph is actually black before any forces are made. Do you have a question? Uh, I was going to say that one, that one seems fairly straightforward to get right away. Yeah, so typically the only graph that has this property is the graph that have no edges. 
because we got the signatures. And so now we we didn't completely characterize this um, result of graphs that have more population time one, but we have results regarding it. So we, this, we have this observation here that if the minimum propagation time of the graph is equal to one, then the zero forcing number of the graph is greater than or equal to half of its order. But this example actually shows that this observation is necessary but not sufficient. So here we have the graph of a, we have a complete graph on four vertices with an, an additional leaf added to the vertices. So we have that the zero forcing number of this graph is three. So by choosing one, two, and three, but this is the forcing number of this graph, we could, at time one, this vertex would perform force, and it would force this vertex to be black. And at time two, this vertex would perform force, and it forces this to be black. This is why this, is, this example shows that the condition about the observation is necessary, but it's not sufficient, because it doesn't exactly give us what we want. So we turn to matching graphs. And so a matching graph is just a disjoint union of two graphs in which we have a perfect matching between the vertices, as we have here with a complete graph on four vertices and the graph of a paw. This, this is what we the graph of a paw. So we notice that every vertex of the complete graph on four vertices is a match to exactly one graph, one vertex in the graph of a paw. So from that, we prove the following theorem that. Can I, can I ask a question about that? So when you say that they match up, the what what limitations are, are we making on that, that mapping? Um, so these are mapped with just P2s, but we can there's not really many. We've only talked about graphs with like that's only P2. So it's a particular part of the P2. And so the perfect matching is that only one every vertex is mapped to exactly one other vertex. Okay. So we don't have any overlapping as in this vertex is matched to this one as well as this one. So every vertex has to be mapped to another vertex and only one. I think, what, I think what's going on here is if you take two graphs, H1, H2, and you take any bijection you feel like between their vertices, you add one edge per per uh, mapping in the bijection. And those are what give the red edges in your picture. Okay. That's the matching graph. So we can, so the, this, we can, to, so to be a matching graph, we just have to have another a graph that has the same number of vertices, mm -hmm. and that's the only sort of limitation. Yeah, that's the only limitation to be a matching graph, but there's a little more limitation when we talk about the minimum propagation time actually being one. Okay. So for the next theorem, we prove that the minimum propagation time of a matching graph is equal to one if and only if the matching graph is, so the graph H, as we have here in the pop, is H, is connected. And so, as we have here, that zero force number of this graph is four, and at time one, all of these vertices can perform a force. And so, we have that minimum propagation time of this graph is one. But we can show that if, yeah, so this actually shows that the converse of this theorem is not true. So we have a connected graph here, and notice that the zero force number of this graph is just three, but we have eight vertices in all total. So but the, the first number of this graph is three, but the propagation time of this graph is three. It's three as well, so it's not actually one. So here, we can choose at time one, this vertex can perform a force. So at time one, this vertex forces this vertex to be black, and this vertex will form the force, and it forces this vertex to be black. And at time two, this vertex can perform a force, and it forces this, graph to be, this vertex to be black. And at time three, we have these two vertices left, and using the color change rule, which we have from earlier, we can both we can force both of these vertices to be black, and so this gives us a propagation time of three for this graph, even though we have two connected graphs. And now that we've have, we basically characterized graphs with extreme propagation times, so we want to know are there any other graph parameters that can serve as bounds for the minimum propagation time of the graph? So we looked at diameter, and we proved that for a tree. So we proved the following theorem: that T be a tree, and that B be a kind of zero force instead of T then the minimum propagation time of the tree with respect to the zero force and set is always less than or equal to the diameter of a tree. So that gives us the result that the minimum propagation time of a tree is less than or equal to the maximum propagation time of a tree, which is less than or equal to the diameter of a tree. And so from that, we also wanted to show you that on the, on the next slide, this shows that the diameter of a tree can be arbitrarily larger than the minimum propagation time of a tree. So the diameter of a tree is just the longest distance between two, any two vertices. So we have here a column of three vertices in which case can go into zero mod four because this is the easiest one to see. 
and any of this would be really difficult. To, well, not really difficult to see, but really, really difficult. But this is the most, this is the easiest one you can see. So we have one propagation time of this graph is three, because if at time one, all the vertices that are black here, they all force down. At time two, all of these vertices, all of the vertices that were just forced at time one, forced either left or right, and at, all, and at time three, all of the vertices are forced up. So in the color, it will color the entire graph to be black. But the diameter of this graph is k plus one because the longest distance from this vertex to this vertex is the number of k vertices plus one. So that's the diameter of the, for that graph. And so from that, from the from the theorem that we got for the diameter of the tree, we wanted to see, we posed the following question: Is diameter a bound for the is diameter a bound for the propagation for a general is diameter generally a bound for the propagation time of the graph? And so. The graph of the dot actually shows us that the result is actually negative because the diameter of this graph, G, is equal to 2, and the diameter of the graph is the longest induced path. So the diameter of this graph is equal to 2, but the minimum propagation time of this graph is 3. So we choose AC, BC, or DE as our minimum zero enforcement test of this graph. We can enforce this entire graph because these are also isomorphic. This entire graph will be forced at time with propagation time 3 using the, these fossil zero force sets. And there's no other zero force sets of this actual graph. And this basically concludes my research that we did from over the summer. And I'd like to thank you for listening and are there any questions. I guess where do you see where do you see yourself going from here? Do you plan on further results in this? Yes, yeah, so we didn't quite characterize the um, propagation time of the graph is equal to the propagation, the minimum propagation time of the graph equal to one. So I went to Iowa a couple weeks ago, and I actually got a new lead on it, so I'm actually working on it now. And this hey, this has already been submitted for publishing, so hopefully we'll get the other results out between now and sometime in January, because we are, we're also working on other results, as, such as efficient zero enforcement sets that we studied over the summer, and we're trying to create more. And I guess one other thing, this may not go much of anywhere, but have you explored any connection between uh, propagation times, or not two propagation times, but between the size of ZG and uh, the chromatic number of the graph? Because all these things you mentioned are paths, they're all chromatic number two, maybe three. Mm -hmm. And those are all the instances which have really small zero four sets. Yes. No, we haven't. But I will be Chromatic number, that's the minimum number of colors that we can use to color the vertices properly, properly so, such that no two adjacent vertices have the same color. I'm sorry, graph three. There you go. <laughs> yeah, which is why I figured that uh, this could be relevant here because uh, with a with a path, you color you properly color a path by alternating colors as you go down. And uh, I didn't know if there would be any kind of correlation to how the, the sort of black signal spreads its way along. This is just the only thing I can think of in a couple of minutes. Oh. Yeah. Well, the whole, idea, the whole idea of zero forcing was introduced by my, my faculty advisor. Her, she and a few other colleagues worked on this. And then this summer, she just gave us the opportunity. That was one of the questions we raised, the, which he raised at the very beginning. That was the first thing we thought about. What about the time of this graph? And so, she allowed us to do that because it was very open-ended research, and so we have we actually still have two different groups from this. So we have also the edge subdivision group as well. Mm -hmm. we potentially look into direct enforcing as well if that's well if that's well defined. Okay. If there are directions on the edges. Okay. Is it true that you're going to be presenting this in the meetings? I am going to be presenting this. And the post from the drawing meetings, I haven't submitted for abstract for the talk, but I will be presenting this at NAM Math Fest in two weeks in New Orleans. In where? In New Orleans. Right on. And then next week I'll be at South Mass and Colorado. Now I realize when I missed a week in high school, it's, it's, oh, yes. Yeah. 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 I realized that today. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm very well joining. Oh, we have light refreshments in the matrix.